This video is a love letter to All Star 6, which shouldn't be shocking since I already put out an entire video that was a love letter to All Star 6, but what can I say? I'm smitten. Spoiler alert for the entire season, including the winner, and a lot of behind the scenes tea. This is such a special season. This video is about more of the production side. No good season is that good all on its own. There's always an amazing production team behind the scenes pulling some strings to make sure things fall into place the way that they do. The better the season, the better the production team is at hiding their tampering. And to a casual viewer of Drag Race, not a crazy film degree owning, weaponizing my BFA to dissect every moment of reality television viewer like me, there really are very few moments on All Star 6 that stand out as rigged. Coming from Drag Race Down Under and Drag Race Season 13, where even the most lackadaisical of viewers could point out how obviously rigged those seasons were, there was a breath of fresh air with All Stars 6. This season did an amazing job of balancing all of the best things about Drag Race and excelling at all of them. I'm going to say this, and maybe it is the recency bias, maybe it's just my own personal preference, but I'm just going to say it, this is the best season of All Stars. All Stars 2 has been regarded as the paramount season of Drag Race, and I believed that for a really long time. But I don't think it's aged as well as some other seasons have, like season 6 for example. One reason I think is because there's a lot of moments that just make me feel icky. Jeremy's edit and elimination are some of the worst moments of edit dumping I have ever seen. And seeing how he's been treated by the fans ever since, it's hard to watch looking back now. And just like the Alyssa and Tatiana eliminations, they don't feel good to watch. They didn't feel good to watch back then, but they definitely don't feel good to watch back now with the knowledge that, like, Detox wanted to switch her lipstick and eliminate Roxy instead of Alyssa, but chickened out. I, I don't know. All Stars 2 is an amazing season of Drag Race that changed the franchise forever, but it's not without its flaws. All Stars 6, I think, has way less of those icky moments that will lead it to aging a lot better in the future. Scarlet's elimination was rough, Trinity's elimination was heartbreaking, but there weren't like the nasty edits, the constant rigged moments, and unlike All Stars 2, there was no obvious winner, so the entire season was a thrill to watch. But just because the rigging wasn't obvious doesn't mean it wasn't there. There are no coincidences in reality TV, and let's just say this season had a lot of coincidences. And we're going to break them all down episode by episode while also spilling tea we got from the Queen's postseason. But before we get into that, make sure you are following me. Come on, can I say this every week? Come on, just follow me on my Instagram and my Twitter. I'm just joking, you don't have to. But I do a lot of fun stuff there if you like polls or stuff like that. And also, if you want, check out my Patreon. We have a lot of fun stuff going on at the moment for as little as $1. You get early videos. On the $5 tier, you get exclusive videos. And if you win one of our many games or contests, you can pick what video you want for the month. So get into all of that. Now, usually I would start these videos by talking about how like three or four queens had an obvious advantage going into the season, whether it be because of their status as a fan favorite, their dominance in past seasons, what have you. But this season, there's really not any glaring standouts. Eureka has a show on HBO and killed season 10, but she did not get a good fan reception at all in either of her seasons. So I feel like those statements kind of just cancel each other out. Ginger slayed season 7, and then didn't slay All Stars 2, but she really didn't have a good fan reception either. Yada Sophia was a huge fan favorite in earlier seasons, making it to the end game of both of her outings, but in recent years, she hasn't been a huge name in the fandom. 
And then there's Jan, who was a major fan favorite on season 12, but she had just come off of her season coming into this All-Stars, so she was lacking the legacy that some of these queens from older seasons have. This cast was a major risk for the show. It is filled with queens that the fans either didn't click with or straight up didn't like, and then, you know, cyberbullied for years. Silky, Akiria, Eureka, Ginger, Raja, Serena, Pandora even, all got unfavorable edits on prior seasons that led to fan backlash. That's more than half the cast, but that leads us into what I think is the theme of this season, redemption. And I'm sure you're thinking, bitch, this is All-Stars, isn't that the theme of every season? And in response, I'm going to say, it should be. And it might be promoted that way, but watching the actual seasons, usually only a very few queens get a true redemption. All-Stars 3, for example. Aja slays half the season, but production is more worried about focusing on queens that fans already love and have slayed prior seasons like Shangela and Dela, and Aja gets cast aside and eliminated. Past seasons of All-Stars have been more invested in creating drama and tweetable moments rather than showcasing the queens themselves and who they are and how they've grown. But this season, we don't get the villain edits and the manufactured drama. We get in-depth looks at all of these queens. We've been updated on their journeys, we've seen their growth, and with almost all of them, come around to seeing them not as reality television characters, but real people. The fact that Kylie Sonique Love a queen who was fourth out on season two, barely featured in any of the episodes until the reunion, and then cast aside until the Christmas special almost a decade later. The fact that she is our current reigning All-Stars winner, that is redemption. We knew Alaska was going to win. We knew Trixie was going to win somehow. We knew Shay was going to win. But this season truly was exciting from start to finish because we never knew who was going to leave next, or who was going to be in that top four. So let's break down the season, starting with episode one, the talent show. Uh, sorry, I mean the variety show. Where's the variety? We don't know. We can't find her. So now these first two episodes actually had some of the biggest upsets in the entire season with the fan base. Jan being shut out of this episode, Scarlett being shut out of the next episode, Twitter was ablaze with, Jan was robbed, Scarlet was robbed. Well, were they? Let's take a look. Unlike regular seasons, All-Star seasons usually are pretty rigged right from the start. They don't need to like step back and see who starts to emerge as a standout or has storylines because they already know who these queens are and what the storylines they're coming in with are. The thing that makes the season so difficult to judge is that so many weeks there were like four or five queens who could have feasibly won the challenge, especially in this first couple episodes and the last couple episodes. Very few times was there a clear winner rather than a handful of queens who were all deserving of the win. And that's how I feel about this talent show. Raja and Scarlett both have very unique performances, which after six seasons of this challenge is really hard to do. Raja sewing a dress in 60 seconds, I mean, gag. And then we get a lot of the familiar, but some still amazing performances nonetheless. Jan, the alleged robbed winner of this challenge, gave some of the best vocals we've literally ever heard in <laughs> this show. Eureka lip syncs to an original song, but the projections that she has on her dress give a unique take. Yara does, well, what Yara did, I guess. <laughs> now, I'll save my opinions on what maybe should have happened in these episodes for the follow-up to this video where we discuss how this season would have went if it was all judged fairly, but let's look at some of the potential rigging in this episode. Yara's win. Um... Ugh. On one hand, it makes sense, because this is the humor that is right up RuPaul's alley, unless your name is Rock'em Sakura, or etc, etc. But in a challenge where so many queens showcased, like, true talents, playing the piano, singing, sewing, Yada shaking a breastplate around kind of gets lost in the shuffle. 
as a Yada fan, it's so Yada, of course, and I was living, but do I think it deserved the win? No, it, it was a solid, safe performance, if you ask me. So why did she win? I have a theory. Yes, Yada is a huge fan favorite from the early seasons and a favorite of RuPaul, but I think it has more to do with the voting aspect of the season. This twist on All Stars 5 flopped because the queens almost the entire season voted fairly and it led to little drama except for like those couple rogue Shea votes in episode 3. Yada is such a wild card. She's someone who maybe doesn't think every decision she makes through, maybe as much as she should. And if anyone on this cast wasn't going to play by the rules, it was Yada. If Raja won, or Scarlet, or Jan, they would just play the game fair and send home the person who did the worst. They are smart, they're strategic, they know not to ruffle any feathers this soon in the season. But Yada? Yada is going to do whatever Yada feels like doing in that moment. And by shaking up the vote this early, who knows what chaos it could cause as the season progresses. Now, we know what actually happened was Yada voted for the person who did the worst, which is, I guess, backwards from what they thought might happen. But it still caused drama nonetheless and sets Yada up as an opposing force to the norm the other queens are trying to set moving forward. So let's shift the focus to Jan, the robbed goddess, until she wasn't, and then she became the villain the fandom sends hate to. I truly hate it here. There was some controversy after Silky's elimination when Entertainment Weekly asked her in her exit interview why she voted for Akira, who was her best friend, instead of voting for Jan when the three of them were in the bottom. Silky's response was, The voting was weird. The feeling in the voting is like, if you don't vote for who the group thinks should go home, you're going to be the next bitch. I didn't feel like we should have voted for Serena Cha-Cha. Serena didn't have the worst talent show, but the group made their mind up that Trinity K. Bonet has more to offer than Serena, so the group, so the group said we're voting for Serena to go home, and if I didn't pull Serena's lipstick, I was going to be next. That's how I felt. Now the real tea came when she started talking about Jan, and we're talking about episode three, The Side Hustles. This is what she's referring to. I feel like Jan did the worst in the challenge. If you go to the week before, Jan brought that blue corset from home and just decorated it. I felt like she didn't put effort into the challenge. Jan is a singer and didn't sing live at the talent show. I sang live. I based it on efforts. I was going to vote for her, but Akira told me, if you stay and vote for Jan, the other girls are going to get you out. Oof. Well, Jan very quickly ran to Twitter to clear things up, tweeting, Hey everyone, I'd just like to clear something up. I did sing live during my talent show. I sent in a track that had 10% volume of the verse and 30% volume of the chorus vocals underneath, like most pop stars. I also had an earpiece in as a monitor for my singing. So obviously fans were very confused, but I think I might have solved the mystery here. Now, back on All Stars 5, B sang a song for the talent show, and the vocals were the original ones on the track, literally just ripped from the track and put in the episode. But B said on social media that she did sing live, but they didn't air the live vocals on the show, instead just the vocals from the track. Whether that was because there were audio issues, or they liked the recorded vocals better, who knows, but I think the same thing happens here with Jan. If you listen to Jantasy on Spotify, because why are you still using Apple Music in 2021, it is the exact same vocals that we hear in the variety show. So Jan's claims were probably correct that she did sing live, but the editors instead just used the original vocals from the song for whatever reason, and that is maybe where Silky got confused. Or Jan is just straight up lying, but I feel like if she was, someone else who was there would probably have called her out by now. Watching Jan's variety performance, it's great. I mean, the vocals are insane, but in my opinion, it fell just a little bit short because it felt incomplete. She's there standing and she's singing a little bit and then it's over. Well, it fell short because it was short. Every other queen had around a minute for their performance give or take, but Jan's was around 40 seconds. 
And Alaska calls this out on Race Chaser. There's so much drama to follow. <laughs> Mentioning that they cut some of the better bits that she had. Well, that's interesting. So then when the full song came out, I'm guessing that the first minute and five seconds is the full performance that was then cut down. So what did they cut? The performance that we see starts with Jan saying her iconic line, you're safe. But before that, the actual song starts with her You Don't Know Me verse. My stunning look, the sickening hook, I can't do everything. And did I mention you'll be gaga when I start to? And then it cuts to You're Safe. And the song starts. Then, after the verse, there's a fun little cheerleady pre-chorus referencing the past winners that goes, Chad, Alaska, Trixie, and Monet, but who's going to come after Trinity and Shay? Oh wait, that's me. Then they go into the chorus. I mean, lyrically, these are the best parts of the song. The opening referencing her time on season 12, the verse introducing her as the new winner. These are the moments that I think would have made the performance feel more complete. And honestly, they probably edited them out because it would be so obvious she deserved to win if they left them in. Without them, I was just like, yeah, she did good, but like, where was the flavor? Well, the flavor was edited out. Jan's entire story arc is about being a people pleaser, so I'm sure production figured her winning the first episode would lead to a pretty boring standard elimination. So edit out her best parts, keep her safe, that's great to continue her storyline from season 12, and give the win to Yada where we'll have some shakeup in the elimination. Now as for the bottoms, it checks out, but let's talk about Miss Cha-Cha. Now, you Chacharinas, I think y'all were doomed from the start. I truly think Serena was set up to go home first from the very beginning. No matter how well she did, that first episode, it gives her her flowers, talks about how much she's grown, plugs her business, and then kind of shuffles her out. And this might be a good time as ever to talk about the lip sync assassin. The true redemption of the season, this twist was so bad on All Stars 5, but truly made All-Star 6 so much more interesting and fun. What's like truly interesting and makes my little riggery bell go off are some of these choices. Also, side note, can we please give the intern who chose these lip sync songs a raise? I mean, the amount of iconic bops that we got to see, Stupid Love, Miss You Much, Chef's Kiss Truly. So we have Coco Montrese. She is and will always be the moment. Bring her back for All Star 7. I'm begging. Yada and Coco lip sync to Uptown Funk. Coco wins. Deservedly so. Are we surprised? Not one bit. But Coco gets to send home Serena Cha Cha. That's interesting since they have so much history from season 5. Hmm, what a full circle moment. We'll get back to this later. I'm just kind of setting up my argument, planting little seeds. Let's uh, move on to episode two, which is the blue ball. I'm so happy we got a true full ball on All Stars. I, it's, I feel like it should be on every season. Now, this episode was hard to judge, I think, because there were three categories and not many queens hit slam dunks in all three. So you could make a lot of arguments for who should be on the top, who should be in the bottom, but I don't think that there were any arguments over Jiggly going this episode. She's an absolute legend. I'm so happy to have seen her back, but like this was her time, especially when she had one of the worst variety show performances as well. But like kudos to the editors for this incredible two episode arc with her and Ginger. Now, why was Yada in the bottom here? There's a few reasons that I think make sense. Let's talk through them. One, she was becoming sort of a nuisance to the other girls in the workroom. And this is highlighted very much in the edit. And they also highlight how she waits until the last moment to start making her look because she knows she can turn the party in 20 minutes. And you did, Queen. So the episode really sets up this story of, like, she's worthy of going home because of these reasons. But hey, she just won the first episode, so what are you going to do? So bring in Miss Raja, the moment, the queen, the legend. It it just makes sense for her to win this episode. Did I personally love Scarlett's final look more? Yes, 
But I think it was one of those things where, like, if you put Scarlett and Raja next to each other on main stage for critiques, it's really going to highlight how much better Scarlett's dress was. And I think it might be kind of obvious she maybe deserved the win. So instead, they just kept her safe and sort of out of the spotlight. But Raja comes in this season with really one of the worst edits the show had ever seen on season 11. I mean, she was ripping people to shreds in her confessional and to their faces basically every time we see her. Is she going to be shady and take out Yada, or is she going to go with the pack and take out Jiggly? Plus, we just saw her in the top for her Amazing Variety performance, sewing a dress in a minute. So seeing her get her flowers this episode for her sewing skills just kind of makes sense. And then we have Eureka and Kylie in the top. And I know there's a lot of discourse over this. People say the top should have been Raja, Scarlet, and Jan. But Kylie had three amazing looks. And if they wanted to see her around until the end game, putting her in the top early on and highlighting her growth is a great start to that story arc. And then with Scarlet not being allowed in the top three, she was my fourth favorite, I would say. So it makes sense that she ends up in the top three. And then why does Eureka be in the top instead of Jan? Um, I'm not really sure. Maybe they wanted to keep the safe storyline going with Jan. Maybe this was making up for the fact that Eureka was snubbed of a top spot in The Last Ball on Earth. Who knows? All right, this week's lip sync assassin is Brooklyn Heights. Oh, okay, get it? Because Brooke and Raja were on season 11 together. And Raja was definitely scared by her reaction to seeing her since Brooke was such an assassin on that season. Do you get it? Do you get the reference? <laughs> Moving on. Episode 3, The Side Hustles Challenge. Now, I haven't seen much discourse over this, so maybe it's just me. But I don't think it was necessarily fair to make this be judged in teams. Yes, they were coming up with the ideas together, but as we saw, they were vastly different levels of performances on each team. Team Fix-It Bitch were definitely the most consistent. They all slayed. But we have Ginger and Eureka really standing out in their teams from the pack. There's actually another challenge this season I think made way more sense to judge in teams. We'll talk about that in a bit. Now, throwing Ginger's entire team in the bottom four. I tend to think that putting more people in the bottom than deserve it, it doesn't usually sit right with me. Like calling back to All Stars 5, those last couple episodes where just everyone was in the bottom if you weren't the winner, I, di I didn't like it. The fact that Jujubee was in the bottom for her Eartha kit during Snatch Game, no. No, 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 no. That's how I feel about Ginger in this episode, and to a lesser extent, Jan. There were clear issues with both Akira and Silky's performances, and I think they very easily could have just been the bottom two, and then that's that. Throw Jan as low, keep Ginger as safe, easy peasy. But it's more dramatic, obviously, to have a whole team be in the bottom together and have to throw each other under the bus, and that's what we see happen. That Silky and Jan moment, I was like, oop! I mean, these girls were fighting to stay, and it made for great TV, but was it necessarily the fairest thing for Ginger to be in the bottom, despite having a pretty good performance? No, not really. So, Trinity versus Laganja. Oh, wow. Because, do you remember? Do you guys remember? They were on season six together. They were like the two lip sync assassins of season six, and now they're lip syncing here. How fun. Okay. <laughs> episode four. I swear I'm getting somewhere with that. All right, episode four, The Halftime Show. Another big upset in the season. The episode where Jan passes that robbed crown to TKB. I'm actually a little confused as to how this narrative got so big. I mean, it really jump-started the heel turn on Jan with the fandom. And for what? This is one of those episodes where they both, in my opinion, slayed. They both had the hardest choreo, which they nailed. They truly embodied their characters to a T. They looked the part. They were on even ground, in my opinion, in the halftime show. Both perfection. And then Jan ate the runway, while Trinity looked fine. So the way I see it, the runway breaks the tie in Jan's favor. Regardless if you think Trinity did better, Jan killed this challenge, and you can't say it was rigged for her. But this episode was definitely rigged for some other people. 
how Eureka was in the top, I have no clue. How Akira was in the bottom, I have no clue. One thing I wonder about this challenge, and I was hoping there would be tea about it in an exit interview or something, but there wasn't that I could find at least, how were the picks for this challenge done? Did production pick a list of performers and then make the song and then give the queens the list of performers they could choose from? Or did the queens truly just have free reign over any halftime performer ever? And then they took that list and made the song from there. I tend to think it's probably the first option. Making a song like this takes a lot of time. You have to like make the music in the style of the artist, find someone to do the voice, put it all together. And the All-Stars have like a little under a month to get their stuff together. So I kind of find it hard to believe that they would only give themselves a month to make this like 10 minute song based off of what the Queens chose. I think it makes more sense that they worked on the song, got it finished, then sent out a list of performers on the song to the Queens to then pick from. Maybe I'm wrong, but to me that makes more sense. If anyone found any tea on that, please send it to me because I'm genuinely so curious. Because, like, why else would Ginger pick Fergie unless she had to? Like, what a weird choice. It's no wonder she was in the bottom three. Fergie is great, but she doesn't have, like, as distinctive of an image or of a personality like most of the other performers here. Maybe she was trying to capitalize on her, like, <laughs> national anthem flub. I'm not sure. It's a weird choice. How Eureka was in the top for Madonna when Kylie was right there as Steven Tyler. I mean, Steven Tyler's spirit, I know he's still alive, but his spirit entered Kylie on that stage. And Eureka was Eureka. Which leads to another question. Why did the choreographers want Eureka to do all of her Eureka moves? Like, Eureka has moves that she does pretty frequently. The high kick, the split, and then she like pounds it on the stage in a circle. Like, those are things that she's known for. I see that and I'm like, oh, that's the Eureka. Madonna doesn't high kick. Just like how they didn't have Raja doing anything other than stand there because that's what Diana Ross does. It was weird that Eureka was given choreography that was just clearly not Madonna. At least she wasn't penalized for it because I would have been more like, mm, yeah, she's in the bottom and deserves it. But like, why did she do that in the first place? You know what I mean? Now we can talk about Akiria. I don't know what this woman did to piss off production so bad, but they had a vendetta. First, she's in the bottom three for the ball, and for what? And now she's in the bottom two for not giving enough prints. I thought she was a actual a highlight of the challenge for me. I would put her right around like my fifth or sixth favorite of the night. She looked amazing. She had the groove and the moves and the guitar, the mu everything. Akuria didn't get a great reception on season 11, but she didn't get like the worst. She's kind of just there. We don't learn a lot about her. We don't hear from her a lot. She's just kind of the polished pageant queen who can twerk and sew and sometimes is shady. But now she's back for All Stars 6 and the season made me fall in love with Akuria really with all the queens, but I didn't have an opinion one way or the other on Akira before All-Star 6, but they truly highlighted her in the confessional. We got to learn about her personal life, and she is just such a wonderful soul. Unfortunately, I don't think she was high on the priority list for production, and that shows in her track record, especially in this episode. I think that they really just didn't want to give Ginger another bottom placement this early, especially since she hadn't gotten a win yet. Oh, wait, what was that? Ginger Ray only gets a win next episode? Let's not get ahead of ourselves, whatever. Well, we have a lip sync to discuss. Jessica Wilde. Listen, I love her. She's beautiful, she's talented, hilarious, underrated as hell, but a lip sync assassin, she is not. I'm hoping that this was like a trial run to see the fan response, to see if they liked her, so that they can bring her back for an All-Stars. And I'm really happy that she got the reception that she did because hopefully now we will see her on All Stars. But I actually think this episode was a missed opportunity in the season, which is one of the very few. So Jan picks Akira's lipstick 
because she had the worst track record out of the bottom two. But the other queens all pick Yada because she's annoying. I actually think it would have been gaggy to see Jan send Akira home and then everyone is mad that she didn't pick Yada and Yada has a vengeance because everyone picked her to go and she's still there. But yeah, they give Jan a terrible edit in that lip sync. They really cut that song totally apart, specifically to highlight those moments that she does the weird robot thing. And Jessica sends Yada home. Did you know they're best friends? She just sent her best friend home. Okay, let's talk about it now. At this point, four out of the four lip sync assassins have had direct ties to the storyline. Coco sent home her season five enemy, Serena. Brooklyn Heights and Laganja both lip synced against their fellow lip sync assassins from their seasons. And now Jessica sends home her best friend, Yada. Now, maybe one time, I'll call it a coincidence, but four in a row, and then there's more to come later. Now, this is interesting. Now, Yada says on Instagram shortly after her elimination that Jessica was actually supposed to lip sync a different day. And that's a theory that I had. Maybe they get their assassins and they give them all the lip sync songs. And then they pick and choose which ones go in which order once they know the T for that episode. Makes sense. But Jessica comments back that Yada was incorrect and she was always scheduled to lip sync for that day. So either Yada was telling the truth and Jessica was maybe trying to stay in good with production so they ask her back and was like trying to keep their secret. Or Yada was just bitter and wanted to make the blow of her elimination feel better by saying it was rigged. Honestly, either could be true. I guess we'll never know. But the coincidences with the assassins definitely are not just coincidences, in my opinion. But they make for amazing moments, so who gives a shit, really? Now, we're going to get to probably the biggest upset of the entire season, Pink Table Talks. Let's talk about Miss Scarlet Envy. She really is the queen who leaves the season with the robbed title, again. Now, episodes one, two, and four, she gives incredible performances, all worthy of being in the top. The problem is plenty of other queens had great performances worthy of being in the top two. So production kind of has to juggle who they can put in those spots each week. I think Scarlet ends up being lost in the shuffle. There are just other queens like Kylie and Eureka that production wants to highlight more, and so Scarlet falls by the wayside. So by the time episode 5 comes along, she has been safe literally the entire time. I think what happened here is Scarlet gave her first not great performance, and producers recognized they had a robbed narrative on their hands clear as day. I think we all need to remember the show knows how mad the fans get when queens are quote robbed. They love it because it gets people talking and tweeting and hashtagging and making videos like this one. They love a robbed storyline, which is why we get it so often. At this point, I feel like they know it when they see it. And Scarlet had been doing great, but hadn't had the moment to shine yet. So by taking that all away in one episode, of course people are going to be upset. And what did they do? They tweeted and hashtagged and made videos like this one, and it became one of the most shocking moments of the season. These people have won countless Emmys. Even if they don't always seem like it, they know what they're doing most of the time. We don't talk about Drag Race on here. I mentioned there being an episode I thought was more deserving to be judged in teams, and this is the one. Because unlike the commercial challenge where the queens all had different roles with different amounts of screen time and different purposes, everyone had the same task in this challenge and they were working together to complete the same task. So it was up to the moderator of each team, which they got to choose, which is important, to plan ahead, get everyone on the same page, and then lead the charge in the conversation. But mostly everyone got the same amount of screen time and the same moment to shine and everyone was working together with the same goal. Talk about your life. In the side hustle challenge, one team was dealing with demons while the other was dealing with busted wig lines. This challenge, every team had the same task, and in my opinion, 
it was a much more even playing field, so it maybe should have been judged in teams instead. Where I think the problem is, and is if that were true, Ginger would be in the bottom again. Her group was hands down the worst, and as moderator, I think she really let her team down by not getting them all on the same page beforehand. Because they were all on three different shows. Ginger was on The View, Jan was on Instagram Live, Pandora was in Silent Library, but as the librarian. And what's strange is we have a bottom three in this episode, kind of like they planned for an entire team to be in the bottom. Otherwise, why have a bottom three? Every episode except the other team one has been a bottom two. And I always say in all-star seasons, the number of people in the bottom is very indicative of what they want to happen that week. So did Scarlett and Kylie have some awkward moments? They did, no doubt. But Scarlett told an amazing story about her mothers, and Kylie gave some of the best advice the show has ever heard to Raja. They each had a standout moment that I remember. What I do remember from Jan, Ginger, and Pandora, Jan cracking jokes while Ginger's talking about her weight, and Pandora sitting there deadpan the whole time. I think this could have been a cut and dry episode. Pandora and Jan, you were the obvious worst in the challenge, and Ginger, you dropped the ball as moderator, your team is in the bottom. Eureka, Akira, and Trinity, you had amazing chemistry, and it's obvious Eureka put the work in as the moderator to make sure that you all felt comfortable and on the same page. Eureka, you get the win. It felt very weird for Rue to <laughs> tell Eureka's team, you are the best team of the week. You all did amazing. But then look at Ginger and be like, hey, bitch, you won though. And even Ginger was surprised by the look on her face. I think it came down to Ginger did a solid job with her story. And if she was in the bottom again, that would have been her third time getting a negative critique being in the bottom three. So give her the win so that she spared and cast aside. And then Kylie and Scarlett can be in the bottom with Jan, since they all had pretty much even track records. If you put Jan and Pandora in the bottom two, Pandora's toast. And I don't think the producers were ready for her to go yet. But we'll talk about Pandora more in a little bit. This was the most overproduced episode of the season, in my opinion. And really, the only time I felt icky about what happened. Was Scarlett robbed? I kind of think so. But will she find a ton of success and adoring fans because of it? I also think so. So in the end, she'll be fine. Now, here's tinfoil hat time. This is probably bullshit, but I just love to speculate and theorize. So let me just share. The general vibe is that Eureka probably should have won this episode. Now, the lip sync assassin this episode is the first time this season she had no connection to anything going on. Mayhem Miller lip syncs against Ginger, sends home Scarlet. Okay. But you know who Mayhem does have a connection to? Eureka. They're like besties from season 10. So, hmm, insert Twilight Zone theme song here. Moving on. No proof to back that up. That's just a little thing I was like, that's interesting. American Horror Story. I was really hoping this was going to be good since I love American Horror Story, but as almost all acting challenges are, it was cringe, and it was the one misstep in challenges all season. Now, this episode was pretty cut and dry, placement-wise, pretty much agree with everything, but I found it weird that they made Raja change her, like, the voice that she decided to do for her character. If that's how she interpreted the character, and that's the choice that she made, like, let her do it. And if it flops, then put her on the bottom for it. Also, this very much felt like Kylie's moment to shine from the jump. Her critiques this whole season and last episode when she was in the bottom have been to show more of herself, to come out of her shell a little more, take bigger risks. And this was the perfect opportunity. It felt a little unfair when Michelle basically acted out her entire monologue the exact way she needed to do it especially since I doubt she did that for anyone else. But hey, Kylie still killed it in the end. I really don't have anything to say about the next episode either. Show up, queen. It's a great challenge. Everyone's in the top because everyone did great. 
except Pandora. <laughs> Obviously, Jan's verse didn't fit the theme of the song whatsoever, but oh my gosh, this look. She looked gorgeous. And in a season where the edit undermines Jan every chance it can, of course she's going to go home in a girl group challenge, so whatever. If you haven't seen my video on the rise and fall of Jan, check that out. I dive deep into her entire arc on Drag Race from season 12 until now. So now we have Snatch Game, and I definitely think that they could have given Kylie the win here. Her and Ginger were neck and neck the whole time, hitting every beat and characterizing their celebrities to a T. And I think that with Kylie being the winner of this season, giving her this second win could have made more sense for the final edit. Of course, there's people that are going to say, oh, but the track records. Okay, well, this was your moment to give Kylie a better track record. But Ginger was deserving as well. And it comes down to preference here, I think. Some people think Kylie should have won. Some people think Ginger should have won. Ginger ends up winning. I agree. Like, it's fine. Yeah, sure. I liked Kylie better, but I can't say Ginger didn't slay it as well. Um, and Pandora goes home. And I know I said I wanted to talk about Pandora, but there's not much to say about Pandora. She's been very vocal on social media about how she is upset with her edit, how she is barely in the season at all. And I feel like maybe Pandora was playing, like, close to her chest the whole time. Like, she was too afraid to take those risks and she goes home because of it. So that's that's all I can really say. So now we're at the Drag Tots episode. And everything checks out here as well. Raja killed this challenge, but so did Trinity. And it sucks seeing Trinity in the bottom when she did so well. Like I said, I hate seeing queens do well end up in the bottom. I'm glad this twist didn't come until Final Five this season, unlike All-Stars 5, but still, it's annoying. I know it's meant to tempt the winning queen with sending home potential frontrunners, but no one ever takes the bait, so it's kind of just, like, pointless. We need Naomi Smalls back. <laughs> Please, bring her back already. Now, the last few lip sync assassins have had nothing to do with anything going on. Manila, Alexis, Heidi. But now we have Cameron sending home Eureka. And as we saw from her social media posts, Cameron was definitely not too happy about it. She says that she feels like she was there for a stunt, and if Yada was right about them putting the assassins in wherever they fit, then this would make a lot more sense as to why Cameron was so upset. Because really, it looked like she was over-exaggerating about nothing. But that's T we'll probably never know unless a queen wants to face the wrath of WoW and spill it. Now, we can talk about the Redemption Lip Sync Smackdown, one of the best twists we've ever seen. Like I said, the theme of this season was redemption, and yet another queen gets a major one, Miss Silky Nutmeg Ganache. There was so much talk about, was this episode fair? Was this episode rigged? So let's talk about it. Based on Rue and the judges' looks, it seems almost every one of these lip syncs was filmed the episode after the queen was eliminated, except for the, the second-to-last one with Pandora. So, like, Jiggly and Serena's lip sync was filmed during episode 3, Silky and Jiggly was filmed during episode 4, and so on. Most episodes of Drag Race are filmed in a two- to three-day period, so that gave the queens a little bit of time to put something together for the lip sync. And that's why I say the shit wasn't rigged. Silky just took advantage of all of the tools in her arsenal, while many of the other queens didn't. I mean, there was queens like Scarlet and Pandora who didn't even plan any type of reveal, any stunt, nothing. I mean, if I was one of these eliminated queens, I would have costume reveals, wig reveals, gags, literally anything it took, just like Silky did. She goes actually in depth on all of the gags she had in her Entertainment Weekly interview, but let me go over some of the highlights. In Girls Just Wanna Have Fun, she pulls out the alcohol and makes herself a drink. She said that she brought in those props in case there was a roast challenge. In Song for the Lonely, she made her flag from an umbrella that she brought. In Barbie Girl, she actually sewed that look together in her hotel room the night before, and in Heartbreaker, she made the guitar in her hotel room with the umbrella and some cardboard. 
Now, a lot of people thought that it was unfair that she had the guitar just, like, sitting there waiting for her at the back of the stage, but she reveals she had it under that giant coat she was wearing, and she set it aside discreetly before the number began. I don't see this as unfair. I see it as Silky using every opportunity she had to stay. It's not like none of the other queens could have done the same things in their hotel rooms. If anything, it makes it more impressive that Silky did all of those things in such little time. But Eureka killed that final lip sync and comes back instead. I also saw people upset at this since Silky killed every lip sync prior. A lot of people felt like Rue should have just given her this moment and brought her back. I see the point there, but Silky had been gone for six episodes. There was no chance of her winning the season. I actually think this was the perfect scenario for her. She got to showcase how great of a performer she is without going in and getting eliminated right off the bat again. Eureka going back felt correct since she had done well all season, and as we saw, she legitimately was an option to take the crown. So, the monologues. This episode also stirred up a lot of controversy with the absolutely heartbreaking elimination of TKB. It must suck so bad to think you made it to the top four, think you made it to the end, and then have it ripped away from you in the final seconds. It really was cruel, and I think that the redemption lip sync twist could have been done at final six and been just as effective, but it didn't. And we have a redo of the top five from episode nine, now doing monologues. And much like drag tots, they all do really well. That's what sucks about these last couple episodes. Every queen in that top five did great in both of those challenges, but someone still has to go. A lot of people wanted Trinity to win or for Kylie to win the monologues, and that's valid. I think Eureka, Trinity, or Kylie could have won, and I would have been happy. But looking at who has the best story here, it's Eureka. Her whole arc has been about her doing well, but never getting the win. Plus, she's the returning queen, so it's gaggy to see the queen who comes back actually win a challenge. It totally makes sense why she gets the win here, and I think she did well in the challenge too, so I'm not saying it's like not earned. But, ugh, damn, it sucks seeing Trinity leave. She really was the main character of this season. We hear all of her thoughts and feelings as the entire season progresses. She really felt like a potential winner, but it all gets cut short in the 11th hour, or the 11th episode, rather. But now we are at the finale. This top four really did slay the season, and any of them could have won, which is why they basically filmed every scenario ever for potential winners. So they filmed each of the top four winning, like they usually do, but they also filmed every single combination of double crownings as well, which just proves that WoW had no clue which way the fans were going to react. There was no obvious winner, so they wanted to cover all of their bases. I truly don't think we've seen a closer finale in Drag Race. I mean, it was so tight. Another tinfoil hat moment, but the final four remix is a country song. And all four of the top four are Southern. All of the top five, actually. Imagine if the final four was like Jan, Scarlet, Jiggly, and Pandora doing a country song. Not saying that it's rigged that much, but I'm sure that is something production was maybe thinking about in the back of their head. Just something to think about. Looking at the fan support, Raja and Kylie were far and away the two fan favorites of this top four, and had a giant portion of the fan vote to win. I honestly think this could have been a double crowning, and everyone would have been cool with that. But why not Ginger or Eureka? I think Eureka did an incredible job of showing her growth and development, not just in her drag, but her as a person as well. She was known on seasons 9 and 10 for starting fights and being negative and getting special treatment from production, but this season she showed how she'd grown from that and evolved as a person. I loved Eureka this season but she was already eliminated and that's kind of a curse in the eyes of the fans unless your name is tatiana like there's no chance they're going to root for you if you've already been eliminated 
And then Ginger. She also did extremely well all season. Kind of a rocky start, but then she really got into her groove and killed the second half of the season. I think her issue was that she struggled as coming off as genuine. I mean, look at her monologue. You have Bob and Thorgy and people online saying her story would probably never even happened. That's not good in a challenge meant to connect further with the viewers and to tell you more about who you are as a person. That people are like, girl, that story didn't happen. Come on. Like, mm. so why did Kylie win over Raja? I think at least part of it was social media. Kylie has almost double the Instagram followers Raja does, and she got 70,000 more votes on the Instagram poll to win. But also, just looking at the competition, Kylie was in the bottom three times. Once for the Pink Table Talks, which she really didn't do that bad, and then she was in the bottom for the last two challenges, but that was just by default, and she did really well both episodes. Raja was in the bottom two times but I felt like it was deserved both times. She fell flat in the American Horror Story, and she stumbled in her monologue. And in a challenge that everyone did amazing in, those little mistakes matter. I don't think Kylie had one bad week this entire competition, and Raja had one. That's how minuscule the difference is between these two, which is why I think the double crowning would have been amazing to see, especially since these were two of the least popular queens going into the season. We saw Kylie go on a journey this season, and those arcs are always very pleasing to producers who love a good story with a beginning, middle, and end. Raja started off the season already exactly who she is, and we see her continue to show that throughout the season. But Kylie started off a little meeker, is put in the bottom for it, and from there on out, we see her come out of her shell more and more, showing us who she is and becoming a force in the competition. Her leaving with the win feels like the perfect final chapter of that journey. So overall, was this season rigged? Hell yes. But the way the strings were pulled this time around made for an incredible show. It rarely made us feel the way a lot of other seasons make us feel, which is like that icky feeling and like annoyed that the things that are happening make no sense. So many queens got redemptions this season. Kylie, Raja, Eureka, Ginger. I don't know if Ginger necessarily got one. She didn't need one, but she came off great. Trinity has an incredible redemption arc. Akiria, we get to learn so much more about her than we did on season 11. Obviously, Silky. Even Serena Cha-Cha, this was the season of Redemptions, and I hope every season from here on out uses this as the blueprint. This season is going to go down in the history books. I really think it's going to age really well, and I think Kylie's going to be an amazing winner. I'm so excited to see what she does now that she has the crown. I'm so sad the season is over. But hey, there's like 40 seasons on the way. Hopefully at least one of them manages to capture the magic that this one did. Thank you guys so much for watching. This was a long one, but this was such a good season. I felt like it really deserved the attention and for me to sit down and really break things down. Here are my socials. And of course, thank you to my beautiful, amazing, iconic patrons. There's going to be way more All-Star 6 content coming. There's so much to discuss with the season, not just the rigging. And I'm going to keep the content flowing. So make sure you are subscribed and like the video if you want. That would be great. It has been a long day solving the mystery of what the deeper message was when Pandora said so beautifully, Ha, 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 